ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild Players in Dragonwick, the 20th century Fox picture based on the book by Anya Seton Chase. It stars Vincent Price as Nicholas, Teresa Wright as Miranda, and Glenn Langan as Dr. Turner. The Lady Esther Screen Guild Players in Dragonwick. <laughs> After all these years, sometimes the smallest thing will bring it back. A bit of music, a man's laugh, a bird that's singing in the morning sun, and suddenly I'm there again. Suddenly I'm back at Dragonwick. It was more than I'd ever dared to dream. A girl like me, Miranda Wells, who'd lived all her life on a little farm. I was going to Dragonwick. I can still remember when the letter arrived... Cousin Nicholas Van Rhyne. Cousin Nicholas the Patroon, who owned thousands of acres along the Hudson in a fine big house. Cousin Nicholas was inviting me to come to stay with his family and be a companion to his little girl. To think I'd never even seen a steamboat. Now I was on one, riding upriver. No wonder I was so excited. No wonder I came along, running along the deck. And... Cousin Nicholas! Cousin Nicholas, I saw it. Some of the passengers pointed it out. I saw Dragonwick. I notice you've taken your bonnet off. Oh, I was so excited. Cousin Nicholas, how can you sit there so quietly? I should think that seeing Dragonwick would be more thrilling to you than anyone. Nothing could be thrilling that is shared with so many other people. Did you like what you saw? Oh, I'm afraid I've run out of words. I've said beautiful so often. Every now and then you say golly. I prefer beautiful. Oh. I'll try to remember. Do you mind if I keep off my bonnet just a minute? The breeze feels so wonderful against my face. If you wish. Thank you. Now tell me about Dragonwick. How many rooms? I've never counted them. And a lot of servants? I've never counted them either. Golly! I, I mean, Cousin Nicholas, am I hopeless? Too bad you have to wear a bonnet. The breeze must feel very wonderful indeed with a face as beautiful as yours against it. It was very strange the way he said it. And I might have puzzled over it more, but there was all the excitement of arriving at Dragonwick. The great spacious house, the servants in livery. I was too awed to notice little things. The way I was greeted by Cousin Nicholas's wife. Welcome to Dragonwick, child. I hope you'll be happy. Nicholas, did you remember to bring the pastries? And the first time I found myself with little Katrine. I don't love my mama and papa. They don't love me either. And yet Cousin Nicholas was so gentle with his wife, so thoughtful and considerate, and so kind to the child. I thought no more about the little things. Until that night, I remember that Magda, the housekeeper, was getting me settled in my room. It's a lovely room, Miss Wells. I hope you'll like it. I'm sure I will. Listen. The harpsichord? That's Minya Van Ryan playing. Sometimes he sits alone and plays for hours. It sounds so gay and, and yet sad somehow. Yes. It was brought here by his great-grandmother, Azeel. Azeel? Is that a Dutch name? Oh, she wasn't Dutch. The old Minya brought her in New Orleans. That's her portrait that hangs over the harpsichord. Oh, she was beautiful, wasn't she? And very young. About your age. And not much older when she died. She died so young? Why? They say he never loved her, never wanted her at all. He just wanted their son. And when the child was born, he kept him from her. He forbid her to sing and play. He broke her heart and drove her to... What? Well, they say she prayed for disaster to come to the Van Rhines. And she swore that when it came, she would be here to sing and play. She killed herself in that room at the harpsichord. Oh, that's just kitchen gossip. Oh, no doubt. Of course, I've never heard a zeal play myself. They say in the kitchen that you can never hear it unless you've got Van Rijn blood in you. But the Minier will hear it. And Katrine. That's utter nonsense. Oh, of course. Miss Wells, why have you come here? To be Katrine's companion. Why do you ask? Because 
One day you'll wish with all your heart that you had never come to Dragon Week. Good night. Perhaps that should have made me curious. Perhaps I should have thought more about it. But the life at Dragon Week was so new and thrilling. And a few days later was the 4th of July. I remember the house was filled with guests. I felt awkward and out of place. And then, as though to tell me I was welcome, Cousin Nicholas unlocked the conservatory and took me in to show me about. The plants look rather well, I think. I like to have them at their best on the day of the kermesse. Dr. Nicholas, what exactly is the kermesse? A very old custom. My tenants present their tribute to me, and then eat, drink, and dance to excess at my expense. But paying tribute, what's that got to do with the 4th of July? Nothing. I have made the dates coincide purely as a courtesy to Independence Day. But you haven't yet complimented me on my flowers. I'm afraid I haven't any words again. They're all so... so... Exquisite would be a nice word. This one is a Persian Grinalda. It's my prize. Do you like it? Oh, it's beautiful. So beautiful, it's almost frightening. My dear child, you mustn't let your... Cousin Nicholas. Do you hear that? Oh, oh, of course. It's the Countess de Grenier. When she saw the harpsichord, she said she couldn't wait to play it. Oh, yes. I'm sure the delay has been our loss. She plays very beautifully. Miranda... Don't forget that at the Kermesse Ball, you were to save the first waltz for me. But, but I'd feel out of place. I haven't a proper dress. You will find one in your room. I brought it for you from New York. But I couldn't. I'm so awkward. But Cousin Nicholas, they'll laugh at me. They'll not laugh, Miranda. They will not laugh if you dance with me. He was so gentle and so kind with me. I could scarce believe he was the same man that afternoon at the Kermesse. It was a strange sight, like something out of another world. Cousin Nicholas sitting on a great carved chair, and the farmers stepping up to pay their tribute. One by one they came, as they were called, and I could see their faces were hard and sullen. But each brought his sack of wheat or corn or rye, until the name of Gloss Bleeker was called. Gloss Bleeker. Last bleaker next. I am here, but I've brought no tribute. Uh, you uh, take off your hat before the patroon. I'm a free American citizen. I'll not take off my hat to any man. Uh, Nor will you get so much as a grain of wheat from me. Uh, Class bleaker, do you mean to farm my lands and make no return for the privileges I allow you? Your lands? You hear that man? His lands. Why, the Bleakers have worked the hill farm for 200 years. And for longer than that, the Van Rynes have owned it. We've paid the worth many times over, and you know it. Well, here's the finish. Is that your final decision, Klaas? I... I'm sorry to hear it. But since you feel that way, I order you to leave my land by tomorrow noon. Now, will the rest of you men come forward, please? I have something to say. I'm tired of listening and talking and listening. I'm going to do something now. I saw his knife flash in the sun. I saw a man jump in front of him. I saw the quick, sharp struggle, and when it was over... Mr. Van Ryan, I have his knife... Class will do you no harm. How fortunate, Dr. Turner, for him. He just lost his head, that's all. He doesn't want any violence any more than the rest of us. Dr. Turner, you presume to speak for all of these men? And is that because whatever ideas they may have in their heads, you put them there? That's nonsense. These men are not alone. The anti-rent movement has swept New York State. Man, take your head out of the sand and help solve this problem peacefully. Because it's got to be solved peacefully or not. Listen to me. Listen to me, all of you. Just what is it that Dr. Turner wants you to want so passionately? It has an assortment of highly romantic names. The rights of man, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. But do you imagine they will all be yours with the title to a few acres of soil? Believe me, my welfare does not depend upon you. But my rents and tributes and my responsibilities are hereditary. They are symbols of a way of life to which I have been born. And I shall never relinquish them. Now, who is next? I think I was a little shocked, a little angry. But through the weeks that followed, he was a different man again. So kind and gentle that a blind adoration filled my heart and bolted all I'd seen and heard from my mind. And so it was, until that day in mid-fall. All that day it had been storming fiercely, 
And late that afternoon, as I was passing the conservatory, I noticed that the door was ajar. I thought perhaps the wind had blown it open, but as I went to close it... Who is it? Who's there? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Cousin Nicholas. I thought... Oh, oh, it's you, Miranda. I just came in to get this plant. Johanna's cold is worse. She's going to stay in bed. I thought this might make her illness less unbearable. Why, that's your Grinalda, your favorite. Oh, I'm sure that will make her very happy. Then my wife will be happy, and I will be happy. We'll all be happy. <laughs> now, let's get this door locked. Uh, Van Rang. What is it, Magda? It's Dr. Turner. He's in the great hall. He says it's most urgent. Turner, I've got nothing to say. Oh, uh, never mind. Miranda, will you take this plant up to Johanna for me? Of course. Tell her I've been delayed. I'll be up in a moment. Dr. Turner? Mr. Van Ryn. I wouldn't intrude like this, but it's most important. Klaus Bleeker's been arrested for murder. A pity you weren't there to stop him. I this was time. there. The anti renters were rioting at Snooky Hollow. But Klaus wasn't anywhere near the boy that was shot. They just pinned it on him. They? If you mean the patroons, you must also mean me, in which case I fail to comprehend. I want what... your assurance he'll have a fair trial. Dr. Turner, will you stay for dinner? No, thank you. I'll have the butler set another place. I'd rather not if you don't mind. Dr. Turner, I'm giving you my word. Klaus Bleeker will have a fair and just trial. <laughs> now, of course, you'll stay. <laughs> yes, but it's my turn not to understand. Mrs. Van Ryn has a severe cold, Doctor. I, I was hoping you'd have a look at her. Jeff Turner, dinner guest at Dragonwick. I just couldn't believe it. Nor could I understand why Cousin Nicholas insisted he'd spend the night... Perhaps it was thinking about that that kept me awake. Perhaps it was something else. But toward midnight, I heard a noise on the landing outside my door. And when I went to look... Oh, I like that. I like it. It's pretty. Katrine, why aren't you asleep? I don't want to sleep. It's so beautiful. What is? Don't you hear it? Such a pretty song. From down there. Darling, you've been dreaming. Oh, no. It's a lady... She's singing and playing the harpsichord. Katrine. It's like a lullaby. But it must be funny because sometimes she laughs. There. She's laughing now. Miranda, I don't like it anymore. I'm afraid. I'm afraid make her stop, Miranda. Darling, it's no one. Really, it isn't. You've just been imagining. Don't you see if there was anything out here at two? It, it stopped now. Of course it has never started, really. Come along now. Back to your room. No more bad dreams. Good night, Miranda. Good night, darling. Miss Miranda. Miss Miranda. Magda, what is it? Miss, you better get them in here. Go get the doctor. Magda, what's happened? It's Mrs. Van Ryn. I went in to make her comfortable for the night. I went to straighten the pillow and... What? <laughs> She's dead. <laughs> The second act of the Lady Esther Stringill play will follow in a moment. Now, a word from Lady Esther. Suppose you could consult the leading skin specialists of this country. Suppose you could ask these important doctors, what's the best thing I can do to my skin to make it lovelier? Their advice could be summed up in three little words. Keep it clean. Of course, you'd say, but I do. However, skin specialists know that many very fastidious women never get their skins really clean. And here's why. There's a stubborn film on every woman's skin. It's caused by natural oils mixed with cosmetics and dirt. And ordinary cleansing fails to remove this stubborn film. You think your skin is clean when it isn't. Day after day, this film clogs the pore openings, encouraging blackheads and blemishes. Day after day, it dulls the true freshness and beauty of your skin. But there is a safe, sure way to get rid of that stubborn film. And here it is. Smooth on my unique Lady Esther four-purpose face cream and wipe it off. Immediately, and this is so important, apply Lady Esther cream again and wipe it off. This second cleaning with Lady Esther gets rid of that stubborn, clogging film. Now your skin is really clean. And instantly you see the difference, the clearer, fresher, younger look. You feel the new softness and smoothness. 
the very texture of my unique Lady Esther cream is different. So soft, so effective. That's one reason why my cream cleanses so thoroughly. If you want compliments tomorrow, remove that stubborn film tonight. And now, Lady Esther presents the second act of Dragon Wick, starring Teresa Wright, Vincent Price, and Glenn Langan. Cousin Joanna was dead. I couldn't believe it. And yet, as we stood there in a room, gathered around her bed... Surely you can do something for her, Doctor. I'm afraid not. I can't understand it. It doesn't make sense. Mr. Van Ryan, are you sure she ate nothing that might have... Dr. Turner, you prescribed what she should have for dinner. You told her that she could have that cake. Uh, She insisted so. She'd have eaten it anyway. Could someone else have given her something? No one was with her but myself. Of course, the cake was soaked in rum. Acute indigestion. Yes, it's possible, but I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Is it also possible that she may have been more ill than you thought... That's always a possibility, I'm afraid. At least you admit it, if you'll excuse me. Jeff, I'm sure he didn't mean that you were to blame. Well, whether he meant it or not, it's shameful, isn't it? For a doctor not to know. If I thought there were any reason why he... There couldn't have been. He was always so kind to her. Why, that Rinaldo is his prized plant. And he brought it here just to make her happy. Hmm. Yes. She is smiling, isn't she? Well, you'd better get some sleep. I only can. Good night. Yes? There was a light under your door. I... May I talk with you? Of course. I can remember how that same chapel bell rang on the day that Johanna and I were married. Johanna laughed and said that it was a heavenly bell that would ring for us until death. You were very happy together. Yes. Until Katrine was born. Then we knew that Johanna could have no more children. That I was never to have a son. That there would be no more Van Rhymes after me. Uh, I wish I could help you. I want to so much. Do you? Do you really? Miranda... The bell has stopped. It must be nearly dawn. Miranda, you've known as well as I that this moment would come. It was inevitable. We were inevitable. Please. Otherwise, out of all this world, why should I have called to you and no one else? And why should you have come to me? Tell me. I can't. I don't know. Yes, you do. You've known it for a long time now, just as I have known it. You mustn't say that. It's so soon. Please. You can't help yourself any more than I. Do you love me, Miranda? Tell me that you don't. Forgive me. I had to say it. There was no way for me not to. And no one but you to hear it. Good night, Miranda. Miranda, say you're not angry with me. I'm not angry with you. The day after the funeral, I left for my home. I wanted to be away from him. I wanted to think... But I knew even then what the answer would be. And in May, Nicholas came for me, and we were married. Mistress of Dragonwick, it was more than I'd ever dared to dream. Now I live for only one thing more, to give Nicholas a son. And at last I did. I remember how happy I was when it was over. Nicholas came to me and stood by my bed. And I looked up and smiled and... Nicholas, at last... At last you have a son. I have no son. My son is dead. Magda, you still in the tower room? Yes, Mrs. Van Ryan. How long has it been this time? More than a week, without a word or a sound. The last time it was ten solid days with no... Magda. I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm sure it isn't pleasant for him. And what is it for you? I don't know, Magda. I'm going up to find out. Yes, 
Yes. Nicholas? Oh, it's you. Yes, my dear. I... Uh, this is an unlooked-for pleasure. I wasn't expecting you. Frankly, I had almost succeeded in forgetting you. <laughs> Don't be frightened of me. I'm not frightened. No, I'm sure you're not. You have courage, Miranda. I like that about you. Nicholas, what do you do up here? What do I do? I live. I'm sure you're unable to understand that. I want to understand if you'll help me. Shall I? Shall I tell you what you want to know? Very well. Brace yourself. Prepare to have your God-fearing, farm-bred morality shaken to its core. You see, I am what is vulgarly referred to as a drug addict. Why? Why? No tearful reproaches. No attempts to save me, to regenerate me. Why have you found this necessary? Because I had to set free something within me. Something that ever since I can remember has been like a rock caught in my heart and my brain, pushing at me, choking me. Why not put it in a simple way, Nicholas? You're just plain running away. As simple as that. I know you better than you think. You've always run away whenever you've come up against something unpleasant, something you couldn't change, like the rent laws. Or the death of my son. Our son. Get out. Nicholas, let me help you. I don't need to be helped. Help me, then. Please don't shut me out like this. Let me be unhappy with you and happy again. Let me be part of you. Let me love you and love me, too. Get out. I'm sorry, Nicholas. I had to try. Though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. Miranda? (gasps) Nicholas, you startled me. Miranda... You've been spending so much time in your room, I thought perhaps this plant might make your retirement less unbearable. Persian Granada, your favorite. (laughs) Your happiness is mine. But may I ask why you sit here by the garden window in the half dark? I I was thinking. Does the mere act of thinking always make you look so frightened? What were you thinking of? Of Joanna. Why? I don't know. Poor Joanna, sometimes I... Listen. Listen, do you hear that? What? Nothing. Nothing. The wind in the garden. There is no wind. Yes, there is. No, out there, somewhere, something, a, a creaking board, perhaps. It, it isn't important. It, it's stuck now. But I didn't hear anything. Neither did I. Yes. Yes, you did. From the other room. The harpsichord. Azeel. Stop it. Then Katrine did hear her that night. And you must have heard her when our little son... Kitchen talk. Now you've reached your own level again. I've never believed it, really. Until now. Now I know oh, I'm... Uh, may I come in this way? Dr. Jeff. Mind if I drop in? I just happen to be passing by. Passing by? With an army of farmers marching through my gardens? Oh, their fight is all over now, Van Ryan. And you've lost. The governor signed the anti-rent law last night. Jeff, why have you come here like this? I've been doing some studying. I want to talk about flowers with the patroon. Flowers? I'd advise you to confine yourself to medicine, Doctor. Well, strangely enough, I've learned they're related. Miranda, I'd advise you not to take that plant to your room. I don't understand. It doesn't matter. He does. Van Ryan, is it as pretty as a plant in your late wife's bedroom the night she died? Doctor, you're letting the conversation become rather morbid. I was never able to forget that plant. At the time, I thought it was very beautiful. I found out since it was also very deadly. In fact, that's why I'm here. Nicholas, what does he mean? The granoda is a glucoside, similar to digitalis, but far more poisonous. No. I don't believe it. It was convenient having a doctor on hand, even a bad doctor like myself. It was all so legitimate. She had a bad cold. She couldn't have tasted anything in the cake. It was soaked with rum and it looked... Nicholas, no! Put that gun down! Don't you! No! I'm sorry, ma'am. It was either him or Dr. Jeff. Nicholas. Miranda. He was insane. A murderer. But for him to die like this... Wait. I think he's trying to talk. Yes? What is it, Nicholas? Those... Those men. Tell them to take off their hats in the presence of the patrol. (laughs) 
Thank you, Glenn Langham, Vincent Price, and Teresa Wright for an absorbing performance. We hope you'll be with us again soon. You can count on us, Mr. Bradley. For that matter, you can count on every actor and actress in Hollywood, because we all know the wonderful work being done by the Motion Picture Relief Fund and its country house, and we know that work is made possible largely by this radio program. And now, Vincent Price has something to tell you. Friends, don't forget to send your contribution to the March of Dimes. Join the fight to stamp out infantile paralysis. Remember, it's your fight. Infantile paralysis may attack your own family. Half your contribution goes for medical research. Half stays right in your own community for care and treatment of anyone who needs it. Send your contribution to your local March of Dimes. Thank you, Vincent. And now, before we tell you about next week's show, here's a word from one of America's best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. Thank you, Miss Wright. Ladies, many women write me and say, Lady Esther, one big reason I prefer your cream is that it never leaves my skin feeling greasy or sticky. Well, that's because the very texture of my Lady Esther cream is different, so soft, so effective. You see this difference in the jar, and you feel it as you use my cream. You notice how easily Lady Esther cream spreads, how easily and thoroughly it wipes off. My cream does not leave that messy, sticky, greasy feeling. Instead, it leaves your skin feeling so refreshed, wonderfully clean. My cream is really different because, you see, it's made by a special formula. There is no other cream like Lady Esther. Remember, too, my unique Lady Esther four-purpose face cream does four of the things your skin needs most. Besides cleansing thoroughly, it softens your skin, helps nature refine your pores, and makes a perfect powder base. Lady Esther needs no help from any other cream. Use my unique cream faithfully at least once each day, but remember, always use two applications, one immediately following the other. That's the way to get rid of that stubborn film which hides the true beauty of your skin. That's the way to give your skin its best chance to build new loveliness. Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will present Swell Guy. It will star Anne Blythe and Joseph Cotton. Be sure to listen, will you? Dragon Wick was produced and directed for Lady Esther by Bill Lawrence, adapted by Harry Cronman, and was presented through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of Darrell F. Zanuck's The Razor's Edge. Vincent Price appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, and will soon be seen in their picture, Moss Rose. Teresa Wright appeared through the courtesy of Samuel Goldwyn and is one of the stars in his production, The Best Years of Our Lives. Glenn Langan will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox Technicolor production, The Home Stretch. Music on tonight's program was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Tonight's Lady Esther Screen Guild play is being heard by our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide shortwave and network facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Truman Bradley speaking for Lady Esther. Thank you, and good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Presents the Screen Guild players in RKO's charming homespun comedy, Heavenly Day, by Howard Estabrook and Don Quinn. It stars that well known couple from 79 Wistful Vista, Silver McGee and Molly, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players in Heavenly Day. <laughs> That's Silver McGee of Wistful Vista. And the book he's referring to is lying open on the dining room table. A history book. On one page, a picture of the USS Constitution. 
And on the opposite page, the famous spirit of 76. But it's the ship that's giving Shiver all the trouble. He has just finished carving a model in wood. A small model, but not small enough to go into the bottle that's on the table. And as he stands there ruefully looking at it, it's no use. I'll never get this ship into the bottle. Not a chance. Oh, but gee, I just got the most exciting letter. Must have measured it wrong. Remember Cousin Clark in Washington? Too broad in the beam. McGee, I'll thank you not to refer to my... Re- oh, <laughs> you mean the ship. What's the matter now? Just run into a bottleneck. Or rather, it won't run into a bottleneck. Did you say letter? Who's it from? Cousin Alvin Clark in Washington. He in their mail. Hmm. Yeah, man. That guy tosses five-cent stamps around like they were made out of paper. What do you want? Well, he wants us to come to Washington for a visit. To Washington? I think it's very friendly of Alvin and Hetty. Oh, you'd like them if you knew them. I know too many people now. Do you know what our Christmas card cost us this year? <laughs> Don't talk nonsense. This is the third time they've invited us and we ought to go. Listen, Molly. Washington is no place for yokels with draft suitcases. Well, that's ridiculous. I have a nice alligator bag. It's overcrowded, overworked, overrated, and over our heads financially. Why, the hotel's there. Yeah, but Cousin Alvin wants us to stay at their home. Oh. Sad, yeah. <laughs> but McGee, he wants you to help him with some post-war problems. This might be a big chance for you if you don't, if you want to make something of yourself. <laughs> but you don't seem to. But you could if you had any real spirit or ambition. My gosh, Molly, I don't see why we have to go to Washington just to prove I've got ambition. I could have ambition right here, couldn't I? Well, dear, you make up your little mind about it. I've got to go back in the hall carpet. Okay. Ah, there goes a good kid. He thinks I'll change my mind, but I won't. No, sir, I'm not going to Washington, and I mean that. Why don't you go to Washington, you Because i got no business there. Everybody's got business in Washington, McGee. Everybody but me. Whistle this is good enough for me. It always has been and always will be. Well, maybe you're right. McGee, are you arguing with yourself again? Yeah, and I won, too. <laughs> now, let me see. There must be some way to get this dead dreaded stick into that. Huh? What's that? That's my hearing thing. You been McGee? I'm looking for you. For me? So where'd you come from? Right out of that book on the table there. Right out of history. A history of the greatest nation on earth. Hey, I've seen you. You're the... That's right. The third of 76. Yeah. I'm the fellow in the middle. I'm getting a little tired of it. Sir McGee, you've got to go to Washington. What do you mean, I gotta? They need you down there. Not me. Too many people in Washington messing up the country right now. Sherba McGee, they're waiting for you. Horse feathers. They never even heard of me. Well, that's the reason. It's time they heard the voice of the average man. Average man? Me? <laughs> I'm way above the average. Ah, you think so? <laughs> well, would you like to prove it? Say, by getting that kiss into the bottle? Oh, well, I'm not. All right, then I'll prove to you just how average you are. What? Hey, it went in. You got the ship inside the bottle. My gosh, how'd you do it? Professional secret. Oh, the genie. Well, I have to go now. There's Molly. I just remember what I told you, son. I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. Are you still talking to yourself, dearie? Hey, Molly, you... You hear anything? No. Yeah. You do? Yes, the refrigerator. <laughs> you sure you don't hear? I mean, oh, I see, the... you did it. You got the ship inside the bottle. How on earth did you do it? Oh, it was simple. <laughs> I just concentrated and. I mean, well, it's a sort of professional secret. Say, have you thought anything more about going to Washington? Ah, Washington. That's the last place in the world. <laughs> I ever expected to go, but... I, George Molly, I think we should go. Ha-ha. <laughs> I'm glad you changed your mind, McGee. When can we leave? Why not tonight? The 817. Molly, you start the pack. I'll phone for the ticket. Hello, operator. Give me the Union Depot. Oh, oh, is that you, Mac? Ah, oh, 
What's that, Mac? How's every little thing, Mac? Is he? How's your family? Huh? Tried all over town and couldn't. Couldn't what? How's your family? Oh. <laughs> What's that, Mac? Yeah, you new people. Going to Washington on government business. Strictly hush hush. Huh? I mean, we're going to Washington on the QT. <laughs> Molly, she says we can't go on the QT. We've got to take to Pennsylvania. <laughs> hey, Merck, connect me with the ticket officer. Huh? All the busy? Well, call me back when you get him, will you, Merck? Thanks. What was all that talking with me about government business? Molly, I'm going to tell those people in Washington just what I... Uh, well, your cousin Alvin wants me to help him, doesn't he? That's right. The letter did say that. My goodness, if we're leaving tonight, we'll have to send a telegram. I'll write it out, Mrs. Yeah, just uh, keep it down to ten words. Hmm. Ten to collect. <laughs> I wonder what kind of government work he wants me for. Maybe I'll be a big shot. <laughs> In an average way, of course. <laughs> like undersecretary to the overseer of the exterior of internal revenue or something. <laughs> hey, I'd better get going. Hey, Molly, where's my suitcase? You know? I'm sure I don't know, McGee. You have it like Oh, I know. I know where it is. It's right here in the hall for our... Straighten out that closet one of these days. <laughs> yes, sir, that's what they need in Washington. Someone to talk to the average man. Now, you take an average cab driver like yourself. Me, average? I ain't no average cab driver. I ain't pleaded one fender in seven years. <laughs> and that's the whole idea, Porter. Someone to talk to the average man. Now, you take an average porter like yourself. Oh, I ain't no average porter, mister. Been with the line for 13 years, never got no baggage mixed up once. Now, there's the kind of fellow I mean, Molly. Right there across the aisle. I'll bet he's an average. I'll bet he's as apple as average as an apple. Pipe, 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 pipe. Why don't you speak to me, dearie? I think I will, if I can speak. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. My name's McGee. This is my wife, Mrs. McGee. Well, I'm glad to know you. I'm Dr. Gallup. Well, how do you do, I'm sure? Dr. Gallup. Medicine man? No, Ph.D. Huh? A Ph.D. McGee, doctor of... Uh, of uh, of... Uh... Uh, philosophy. Oh, yes. Any special kind of philosophy, Doc? Well, my business is making surveys of public opinion. You've heard of the Gallup Poll. Oh, sure, Dr. Gallup. Oh, the Gallup Poll. Oh, you know, Doctor, one of your men came to the door and asked me a lot of questions. And nothing embarrassing, of course. <laughs> Just uh, what magazines I read and what movies I saw and what radio programs I liked and so on. Yes, we got a pretty reliable cross-section that way. You do? That's fine. Hey, look, maybe you can tell me, Doc. Do you know if there's any such thing as an average man? Why, well, of course there is. There must be millions of them. Who? I've... Well, I... I couldn't say offhand. Well, just think now. Have you ever seen one? Well, obviously I'm not average. Obviously you're not. Obviously no one is ever going to admit it anyway. <laughs> but there must be John Q. Public, Joe Doak. Doesn't he represent the average man? Personally, I think he's just the will of the rock. And uh, there's some with him. <laughs> now, what I mean, Doc, if you could ever find him. You know, you've got an idea there. I have a good mind to... Yes, I'll do it. What? Make a nationwide survey, a Gallup poll, find out who the average man is and what he thinks. Why, if we can discover him, the real average man, get it across, we could predict elections, anything. Yeah, that's right. You could place a few bets and clean up a lot of dough. And the publicity. The newspapers would just eat it up. Yeah. Every reader would be a potential average man, a possible winner. Why, we might even win to Washington, Dr. Oh, thank you, Porter. Well, tell me, my friend. Are you stopping over in Washington? Yes, I've got some important business there. I'm going uh, to... Ah, McGee. Uh, yes? Well, uh, I may want to get in touch with you. May I have your address? Sure. Mr. and Mrs. Trevor McGee. Uh, uh, 1730 Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, drop in on us, Doctor. Yeah, and bring the wife and questionnaire. Uh, 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 huh? Looks like this is the place, all right, Molly. 1730 Massachusetts Avenue. 
Uh, McGee, uh, how much uh, did you tip the taxi driver? Ten cents. <laughs> really? Only if you're rich can you afford to be stingy. <laughs> Doggone it, I think tipping is un-American. Hey, what's that sticking out of the letterbox? Well, unless my signatism is worse. <laughs> it's a letter. Oh. Let me see. Oh, it's addressed to Mrs. Molly Mc... Hey, it's for me. Uh-oh. Probably our grocery bill. That guy would fall with it if we only went out in the backyard. <laughs> what's it say? Heavenly days. Cousin Alvin's been called away unexpectedly and had he's gone with him. Oh. They've left the key and they want us to make ourselves at home. Well, come on. Let's go in. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So this is how the other half lives. Cousin Alvin is high bracket. I can see that in one expensive glance. You know, he really must be a big guy. Maybe I'll get one of these gilded eggs inside jobs that could set me up for life. Hey, Molly, we're made. Oh, don't shout, McGee. You want the servants to hear you? What servants? I haven't seen anybody around. Hello? Anybody here? Yes, see. Maybe the servants quit. Is that reasonable? Servants don't need a reason for quitting. <laughs> well, just the same, I think. Hey, now, who could that be? Well, I don't know. We'd better answer. They perhaps you think that something's wrong. Yeah, maybe you would. Now, come on. Yes? Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now, just a minute. Senator Bigby, my good man. Senator Bigby. Senator. Yes, indeed. By the will of the people, a clear majority of 8,422, I'd like to see Mr. Clark. <laughs> well, uh, we're sorry, Senator. Mr. and Mrs. Clark are away. Oh, that's too bad. I wanted to discuss our plan. All the details, ideology, indoctrination, implementation, with coordination and solidarity. <clears throat> <clears throat> Well, I shall have to drop by on Wednesday afternoon. Excuse me, Senator, but if the Senate's in session, don't you have to be there on Wednesday afternoon? My good man, the only time I have to be there is when I speak. <clears throat> I'm speaking tomorrow afternoon. You are? Would it be possible to go and hear you, Senator? I mean, well, uh, some friends of Mr. Clark? Of course, of course. What are their names? Mr. and Mrs. Trevor McGee of West Vista. Mr. and Mrs. There you are. You may give them this pass. Oh, thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. Don't mention it. This is enough to do for my good friend, Clark. If you just say I was here. Hmm? Well, good day. Good day. Oh, McGee, a real senator. Yeah. Molly, this does it. That's what? This pass. It's going to take us right into the Senate. I'm going to walk in there and speak up for the average man. What? I'm going to give all those fellas a piece of my mind. Members of the Senate, a gentleman, I stand before you on this solemn occasion. McGee, huh? let's go to bed and get some sleep. Okay. Well, it's a big day in Washington. For one thing, in the office of Dr. Gallup, we'll take this poll right through the nation, a complete cross-section. We've got to find the average man. <laughs> And for another thing in the U.S. Senate. And gentlemen, our glory of our Senate elect, a mere 1,804, only 16% of the total population of the U.S. States, most all our elected representatives. It is my solemn duty. Have you thought of what you're going to say? That we shall have to go. All that was ever to follow. I better wait till he gets through. Well, I suppose that would be more polite. After all, you do have my thoughts. You can't do it, Julian. They see my house now. I promise they're going to run it. Move it away, thank you. Well, you finished, Jerry. Go ahead. It's your turn. <laughs> It's a pretty big joint they got there, Molly. <laughs> you think my voice would reach? Now, don't tell me you're scared. All right. I won't tell you. <laughs> Molly, please, do you think I've got the right? Sure, I've got the right. Gentlemen of the Senate, I have come to speak to you on behalf of all the people of the United States. I think you should find an average man and listen to him. I think an average man might have some ideas with good common sense. Remember, you can't silence the voice of the people. You can't silence the voice of America. 
You can't see the roof of this. Wait a minute. Come on, outside. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Oh, I knew it. Oh, I knew it. Oh, I knew it. Let's see your pack. Don't think I haven't got one, Sorry. And who are you, anyway? Sergeant at all. Oh, I should have known. He's had trouble with sergeants ever since 1917. <laughs> there you are. Here's my pass. Does that give me the right to talk, or does not Listen, only senators can talk in the Senate. Except now and then a foreign official like Winston Churchill. Oh, oh. so you let foreigners talk in there, but not Americans. What kind of a rule is that? Hey, what's I, the meaning of this? What's the reason for this house? Who is just this place? Oh, hello. I'm glad to see you, Senator Bigby. Glad right to see me? I never saw you before in my life. I thought so. Yeah, but, Senator, we met you yesterday. You know what Cousin Alvin? Oh, nonsense. I have no Cousin Alvin. All my cousins are named Ezekiel and Uriah. No, no. No, this is my cousin, Alvin Clark. You know Clark. Oh, oh Clark. Well, why didn't you say so? My gosh, I was trying to. I got no more chance out here than I had in there. I'm sorry, but you must realize this is a very serious matter. No private citizen can speak in the Senate. He can't? You mean a citizen can't even be heard? Only before a Senate committee. And they decide that the idea should be brought to the Senate. You mean a handful of senators can keep out the ideas of everybody in the United States? Yes, sir. No, it's my type. Of all the downright insulting oh, things. Come on, McGee, let's go. Oh, don't take it so hard, dearie. It'll all blow over pretty soon. Not the way they put it in these headlines. Average man talks out of turn. And look, they got my name in it, too. Well, maybe you shouldn't have talked to those reporters. I had to. Nobody else would listen. <laughs> And you think I could have been a big shot just by speaking for the little fellow? Hey, wasn't that the front door? Yes, I wonder who that could be. Give me something—a gun, a baseball bat, anything. I'll defend Cousin Alvin home with my life. Hey. Oh, Cousin Alvin, and the dear Cousin Alvin and Hetty. Oh, hi, Alvin. Um, so nice to have you with us. <laughs> uh, Cousin Hetty, we had no idea when you were returning. Uh, did you have a nice trip? Oh, exhausting. Alvin, do you still want a cup of coffee? Yes, if you please, sir. And take Molly with you. McGee and I will want to talk. Absolutely. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Well, a couple of big shots get together, and that's what they always do. Talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I... I don't quite... All right, come along, Eddie. We'll make that coffee. I know just the way McGee likes to do it. Well, then, McGee, I suppose you've wondered why I asked you here. Well, uh, yes. Uh, sit down. No, thanks. <laughs> I like to meet a situation on my feet. Fine. You see, I've just been appointed to a new position. I uh, strictly hush hush until it's announced, but it may lead to an unofficial post in the cabinet. Cabinet? Oh, hey, that's pretty big. I'll bet you get an enormous salary. Dollar a year? Huh? Out of which I pay my assistant, Matthew. <laughs> you get a dollar a year and you pay me? That's right. Since when did Washington start passing just part of a buck? <laughs> if it ain't asking too much, Alvy, uh, what do we do? Well, in the gigantic swing back to peacetime pursuits, it's my lookout to safeguard the interests, the peace, the happiness of the ordinary citizen. I want to find out what irritates them, what causes unrest, and remove the cause. McGee, we can never have a happy nation until every ordinary citizen is happy. Well, any comments? I think I'll sit down. Good. You're just the man I want. You're pragmatic. That's just a little soreness in my left shoulder. Eh? <laughs> well, uh, here are various forms to be filled out by the public. If you'll just look them over. Uh, hey, hey, wait a minute. Uh, how much of that buck do I get? Shall we say 30 cents? Oh, that's not enough, Alvin. It's things like that that cause unrest. <laughs> 35? Make it 40 and I'll wash the car. Here's the deal. Hello, Dr. Gallup speaking. Oh, yes, William. Reports are piling in, are they? I see. Start changing reactions since that story broke. 
Yes, I thought that fellow McGee had something. Yes. Let me know when you finish the tabulation. <laughs> Well, McGee, how are you making out with those four? I've started a list of objections of what the public doesn't like. Item one, filling out forms. Good point, McGee. Enlarge on that. Enlarge on it? That's the whole trouble, Alvin. All we got to do is think small on it. Uh, I see. You mean uh, simplify, shorten, reduce. Sure. Alvin, now, wait a minute, Hattie. There's your Alvin. Have you seen the afternoon paper? Look. Where? Up on page. In the Senate this morning, that man. Now, Hattie, you're talking about the man I married. Why should we all cover for your mistake? I'll thank you not to talk to my wife that way. Now, McGee, you stay out of this. It's my family. Oh, but are you just going to stand there? No, I'm afraid I'm going to have to take some action. Action? You mean... McGee, this Senate escapade of yours is pretty bad. You know how it is in Washington. You're either a high flyer or a dead duck. Well, I guess I know which one I am. I'm the defunct canvas back. The massacred mallet. Of course, you realize that under the circumstances. Oh, never mind, Alvin. McGee, dearie. Come on home. Oh. Up on that step, Molly cries. Oh, I'm so glad to be back in wistful virtues almost worth a broken leg, you do. Uh, hey. hey! What's all the train for? Someone important getting off the train? Oh, hey, what's the matter again? Hey! Why, it's for us! Mr. McGee! Mr. McGee, congratulations! Congratulations! Dr. Gallup, what are you doing in this town? Well, oh, I flew down just to make the presentation. What? What? As a result of millions of votes tabulated in our latest Gallup poll, it gives me great pleasure to present this award to Mr. Pippa McGee, the nation's choice as the average man. That's an insult! An insult! Oh, never mind, McGee. I love you just the same. But, Mrs. McGee, your husband is a big man just because he's the average man. Now, wait a minute, Doc. I told you I was way above the average. Well, I suppose every free man feels that way, but... Who are we to argue with 40 million people? Come on, they want you to lead the parade. Not me, it's the Grady. I won't stand for it. I won't... Ooh. Hmm. Here's your mind, dearie. Come on. Wait a minute. Anybody got a drum? A drum? What for? To go with that fife. What fife? I don't hear any fife. <laughs> you wouldn't, Doc. You're not average enough. Thank you, Fibber McGee and Molly, for your delightful performances oh. tonight. Oh, it was a pleasure to be here, Mr. Bradley. We know how much this radio program contributes to the Motion Picture Relief Fund and its country house. And we all feel it's a great privilege uh, to share in that work. and Carol Landers. Be sure to listen, will you? Heavenly Days was produced and directed for Lady Esther by Bill Lawrence, adapted by Harry Conman, and was presented through the courtesy of RKO, producers of the Technicolor picture Sinbad the Sailor, starring Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and Maureen O'Hara. Sibber McGee and Molly are heard on their own program each week 
sponsored by the makers of Johnson Wax Products for home and industry. You save enough on the largest size jar of Lady Esther face cream to buy a box of Lady Esther face powder. So remember, ask for the largest size. Music on tonight's program was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hack. Tonight's Lady Esther Screen Guild program is being heard by our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide shortwave and network facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Truman Bradley speaking for Lady Esther. Thank you and good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in the Screen's classic story of a white collar girl, David Hempstead's RKO production, Kitty Foyle, based on a novel by Christopher Morley. It stars Olivia de Havilland as Kitty Foyle, Henry Fonda as Wynne Strafford, and William Lundigan as Dr. Mark. The Lady Esther Screen Guild players in Kitty Foyle. It's an amusing ornament, a little crystal ball that contains a small figure. And if you shake the glass ball, spin and whirl, and then slowly settle like falling snow. An attractive young girl is holding the little glass toy in her hand. She stares at it somberly for a moment, shakes it, watches the gentle falling snow, and then suddenly turns and lifts the phone. This is Miss Foyle. Will you make up my bill, please? I'm leaving tonight. You can send for my bags about 11.30. Yes. I've got to be somewhere at 12. And now, as she puts down the telephone, she finds the glass ball is still in her hand. Again, she shakes it abstractedly. And as the snowflakes whirl about the tiny figure inside... Little girl on a sleigh ride. That's me, I guess. Only you're not a little girl anymore, Kitty. You're a grown-up woman now. I'm only 24. You're 26. Don't try to kid me. Well, anyway, I'm not old. Old enough to make up your mind. And, Kitty, you've got to make it up tonight. Now. Once and for all. I wish I could. Oh, I admit it's a tough decision. You really love them both. But let's go over the whole thing again. Tonight, Mark asked you to marry him, didn't he? Yes. Kitty, we can run up to Greenwich and find the justice of the peace tonight. As soon as I'm through with the hospital, you can get a cab and pick me up there. St. Timothy's Hospital, 12 o'clock sharp. And what did you tell him, Kitty? I told him yes. And you meant it, Kitty, because you're pretty honest. You really meant it until 
Until Wynne came up from Philadelphia. Because I love you, Kitty. Then you love me. It's not too late. It'll never be too late for us. Darling, I'm chucking everything. I'm sailing tonight for South America, and you're coming along. You will come with me, won't you, Kitty? Pier 48, 12 o'clock sharp. And what did you tell him, Kitty? I told him, yes. I couldn't tell him anything else. I love him. Yes, you've always loved him, haven't you? Right from the beginning. Remember, Kitty? Philadelphia. My first job. The little girl from across the tracks. The little girl with the Cinderella complex working on a swanky new magazine. Secretary to the editor, Winward Strafford VI. Well, at least Wynne was trying to do something. Maybe the money did come from his family, but... Well, they could afford it, couldn't they? I'll say. Philadelphia mainliners. That's all they had. Money and blue blood. And so Wynne stepped out and got himself a magazine and a rather attractive secretary. He never even looked at me. But you never gave up dreaming, did you? And then that afternoon... Kitty, remember the one I mean? Yes. He bought a new dictaphone for the office, and I told him his voice sounded different on a record, just like Ronald Coleman. And late that afternoon when I went into his office... Oh. Oh, Miss Foyle. Uh, remember me? It's almost five, Mr. Strafford. I thought I'd look in and see if there was any more dictation to be transcribed. No, uh, uh, no more today. I, oh, but you have a record in the machine. Well, oh, it's, it, it's nothing really high. I was just sitting with it, thinking how it worked. Oh, I'll show you. It's simple. No, no, please. It's, uh, it isn't necessary. Uh, look, why don't you just run along home? Oh, it'll only take a moment. You just turn it to playback and get it started. Oh, Miss Foyle, well, really, I, I... And then you press this button here. Do you really think it's true, Miss Foyle, that my voice sounds rather like that of Mr. Coleman? Huh? Ah, uh, Shangri-La, Miss Foyle. Foyle, Foyle, boil in oil. Roses are red, violets are blue. Miss Foyle has nice legs. I love you. Is that all? And I'll thank you, Miss Foyle, not to sit with your legs crossed during conferences. We have difficulties enough getting this magazine out without such demoralizing exhibitions to... I think I will go home after No, uh, all. wait, please, let me explain. Win, win, boil in gin. Oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I never intended... I was simply testing, you know, one, two, three, I'm like the radio. Home. But you can't, not like this. I mean, uh, Miss Foyle, I, I'd like to give you a little dictation. Will you sit down? If you wish. I'm ready. I, uh, let's see. Enter office memo to Miss Kitty Foyle. I'm sorry I said you cross your legs in conference, but you do. You've got them crossed now. <gasps> I'm sorry I said they demoralize me, but they do. And I'm sorry you seem to think I'm making love to you. But I am. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I haven't finished my dictation, Miss Foyle. P.S. Will you go to dinner with me? Please. Those were happy days, weren't they, Kitty? That summer when everyone was talking politics, remember? The Democrats had a new white hope, a man named Roosevelt. They were sure they'd win at the polls in November. Only you weren't interested in politics, were you, Kitty? There were other things so much more important. Lunches and dinners with wind and long walks at night and Sunday drives into the country to Lake Pocono to watch the sun go down. And sometimes you'd be sitting there beside the lake and sometimes wind would be reading poetry. The staggered Eve had drunk his fill where danced the moon on Monin's rill. And brushed his teeth and combed his hair and took a whiff of the mountain air. Young lady, you've destroyed a beautiful poem. You have no sense of the importance of beauty. Tell me about the importance of beauty, teacher. Glad to. As you know, it's man's duty to instruct women in all subjects. Now you pick the subject. Um, tell me where we are. We are in the Pocono Mountains, situated in the state of Pennsylvania. But where are we really? In heaven? No, in love. Tell me about love. Well, first there was a man. And just as soon as he'd had time to learn his way about, there was a woman. Was the woman beautiful? Very. She had dark red hair. Like mine? And her nose went like so. Like mine? And her eyes were blue-green as the sea itself. Oh, not like mine at all. Not half as deep or beautiful as yours. And what did the man and the woman do? Well, the man looked into the woman's eyes and suddenly beheld all the wonders of life. 
So he leaned over and rubbed her nose with his, like this. And didn't the woman object? No. She loved him, too. Why? Well? I'll tell you. Because he was everything she'd ever dreamed of. Now tell me some more. Well, let me see. Where was I? Here. And don't ever leave when. Ever. summer, everyone said things were getting so bad. There was all that talk about a depression. But it didn't touch you, did it, Kitty? Not till that afternoon in Wynn's office. That's it, Kitty. Short and sweet. The magazine's through. We're folding up. Oh, when? We're folding, and your boss is all washed up. Now, just a moment, young man. I don't like that washed-up stuff from you. You're a nice big boy with plenty of brains, and you've still got your health, haven't you? But don't you see, I... Oh, it's not your fault. You're not the only guy who's been washed up this year. What do you want to do, find some broker friends and jump out a window? I suppose I'll go back to the family bank with Uncle Kenneth. When you can't. They can't make a banker out of you. You're too sweet. Honestly, you're different, Wynn. You've got brains. You're going somewhere. You really believe that, Kitty? Of course I do. I'm in your corner, Wynn. Okay, you've lost the first round. There are 14 more coming up. Well, of course, I might say. What about you? Me? What will you do? That's right, I'm out of a job. I'd forgotten about that. Well, maybe I could get one in New York. A friend of mine lives up there. Oh, I can't let you do that. Why not? Because... It... Well, it's just silly, that's all. Besides, we'd be too far apart. Well, it, it isn't China. Kitty, this is kind of delicate, but, well... Go on. Well, you're all alone, and, well, if you can't handle it, I mean, well, if it isn't your... It isn't your fault the magazine folded, so until you get another job, you won't have to worry about money. What do you mean? I'll just, just keep you on the payroll. It's only fair, you know, because you Forget can... it, Wayne. You don't have to worry about me. I'm free, white, and 21, or almost. I'll love you from here on out or until I stop loving you. But nobody owes a thing to Kitty Foyle except Kitty Foyle. Darling, I'm sorry. I just meant Don't it. Don't say it, please. Goodbye, Wynn. I'll see you before I leave for New York. second act of the Lady Esther Screen Guild play will follow in a moment. Now, a word from Lady Esther. What's your favorite color in clothes? Blue? Red? Brown? Whatever it is, I'm sure it's your favorite color because it's flattering. You look better and feel better when you wear it. But did you ever stop to think that the color of your skin has a lot to do with your most flattering colors? And yet skin specialists say that many, many women never give their skin a chance to show its true, fresh color. And here's why. There's a stubborn film on every woman's skin. Yes, even on your skin. This stubborn film is caused by natural oils mixed with cosmetics and dirt. You can't see or feel this stubborn film. And ordinary cleansing fails to remove it. That's the danger. You think your skin is clean when it isn't. But there is a safe, sure way to remove this stubborn film. Try it tonight. See the actual evidence that even you have this skin cleansing problem. Here's what you do. Smooth on my unique Lady Esther for-purpose face cream and wipe it off. Apply Lady Esther cream again and wipe it off. This second cleansing with Lady Esther gets rid of that stubborn, clogging film. Now your skin is really clean, and instantly you see the difference. The clearer, fresher, younger look. You feel the new softness and smoothness. The very texture of my Lady Esther cream is unique. So soft, so effective. That's one reason why my cream cleanses so thoroughly. If you want compliments tomorrow, remove that stubborn film tonight. And now, Lady Esther presents the second act of Kitty Foyle, starring Henry Fonda, Olivia de Havilland, and William Lundigan. We're 
We're back in Kitty's hotel room now. She's still standing there holding the little glass toy in her hand. For a moment, she stares at it moodily. Then she shakes it again, and as the little white flakes swirl and settle... And so you went to New York, didn't you, Kitty? And you got yourself a job in a tiny apartment with another girl. And you didn't let Wynn know where you were living because... because you were trying to forget. That's when you first met Mark, wasn't it? And he was amusing and you were lonely. And besides, you rather liked him, didn't you? A doctor. An intern. He hadn't even started practice. Funny. He was as poor as Wynn was rich. But you liked him. And you were very good friends. Until that night, when you were coming home on a subway. Have some more popcorn, Kitty. Mm. Good for you. Better than a lot of junky sandwiches. Yes. And cheaper, too. Just like subways are cheaper than cabs. Oh, I don't know. There's a lot to be seen in these subway trains, if you can read. You see that fellow over there? Uh-huh. Heart case. Knew it the minute I saw him. How interesting. And that woman near the door. Allergic. Plain as the nose in your face. You take that old guy over Mark, there. Mark, let's play this is a date and not an autopsy. <laughs> okay. Don't you ever think of anything but your job? Uh, sometimes. You see that kid over there? The little girl? Mm-hmm. He's undernourished. Not enough milk, not enough sun. Thousands of kids like that in New York, and it's going to get worse. Why? This depression. You know, kids like that get under my skin. <laughs> I guess I'm pretty much of a fool anyway. Why? Well, I had a nice offer today. Nice, plushy office. Nice, plushy practice I could inherit, and I turned it down. Why? I'm going to work in a children's clinic. Eighty bucks a month. Did you ever know a bigger dope? I never knew a nicer one. Look, uh, Kitty... Kitty, I've been meaning to ask you... Hold uh, it, Mark. Here's where we get off. Well, here we are. Cinderella returns from another mad, impetuous evening at the movies. <laughs> yeah. Kitty, did you ever fall in love? Yes. One. What kind of a guy? Oh, I don't know what you'd call him, but I thought he was pretty wonderful. Oh. You still love him, huh? Oh, well, why didn't you marry him, then? I guess he had too much money. What? <laughs> Are you running a fever? Nobody's got too much money. He did. You mean... You mean you want a poor guy? I don't want anybody. Oh. You know the trouble with those rich guys. They haven't any way of telling when they're falling in love. You take me, though. A guy like me knows. That's very interesting. How do you know? Well... When I find myself wanting to spend ten bucks on a girl, I know I'm falling in love. I know it's real. Well, I guess you're still safe. Well, that's just the point. How would you like to go out next Saturday night? Dinner and dancing, you know, the works. You mean you want to take me to dinner? Sure, sure, we'll do it up brown. You wear a nice dress and I'll borrow a tux, okay? Okay. Oh, swell, swell. Now if I could only do one thing. What? Rip the next week right out of the calendar. Kitty, isn't this the night of the big date? Uh-huh. Well, don't you think you'd better start dolling up? I will, as soon as I finish this. Oh, the Philadelphia paper again. You know, Kitty, it seems to me... Molly, tonight's the night of the assembly. Assembly? It's a dance. The biggest social event of the year. All the main liners... Wynn said he was going to take me sometime. I used to dream about it. He'd be there tonight... In his shining armor. And you'll be with the dark in a shining stethoscope. And for my dough, that... Hey, who's that? <laughs> Just like Mark, I told him not to come to late. Oh, the way I look, I better scram. I'll, I'll get your bath started, Kitty. Just a minute. Look, what's the idea of... Uh, oh. Hello? When? When? Hello, Kitty. Oh, Wynn, darling. How did you find me? I just followed my heartbeats. Come on, sweetheart, you'll have to hurry. We have a date, you know. A date? For the assembly. We're going to celebrate ours right here in New York. Oh, Wynn, you remembered. How could I ever forget? Wait a minute, I forgot to tell you. Tell me what? How much I love you. How much do you love me? If I said as much as you love me, would that be enough? Enough. 
There wouldn't be any love left for anybody else in the world. You had a wonderful time that night, Kitty. Dinner and champagne at the Ritz, dancing, laughing. And when the place closed at three, Wynn hired the orchestra and dragged you all over to a little Italian restaurant. Because he said an assembly he had to last till six. And it was there, remember, while you were having the traditional assembly breakfast, eggs and sausage and champagne. Kitty, what are you looking so worried about? Five minutes to six. In five minutes, my alarm will be going off. Not anymore. Kitty, will you marry me? Will you? No, dear. Don't you love me? Uh-huh. Well, then why not? When, darling? We're happy now, aren't we? I mean, here this minute. Of course. You know why? Because we love each other. Because we're together. No, it's because we're not in Philadelphia. Now, look, honey, this is no time for bum jokes. I mean it, Wynn. In New York, we're happy. At Pocono, we're happy. In Seattle, in New Orleans, in Dallas, Texas, we'd be happy. But not in Philadelphia. Wait, Kitty, listen. In Philadelphia, you're Darby Mill and I'm Griscom Street. We're two addresses, 23 miles and 500 light years apart. I'm sorry, Wynn. And is that all? Maestro? Yes. Can you play the sidewalks of New York? Yeah, but weekly. You hear that, darling? That's our theme song now. We're New Yorkers, both of us. When, are you kidding? No, Kitty, I mean it. I wish you weren't so right about, about Philadelphia, but you are. So that's the end of it. This is where we'll live, where we'll be happy. Oh, darling. Listen. Church bells. Wedding bells for us. No main line. No Philadelphia. Just you and me. And me and you. Oh, please, God, don't ring the alarm clock. For just a little while. A little while. And so you were married, Kitty. Mr. and Mrs. Winwood Straffer the Sixth. And you had those two lovely, perfect days. And then you went back to Philadelphia to tell Wynne's family. His mother, who was very gentle and sweet, and his uncle Kenneth, the banker, who still said, thee and thou. And you were surprised at how kind they were until Wynne's mother started getting to the point. Of course, uh, Wynne has told us how much he loves you, Kitty. Really, this would all have been quite simple if... Well, if Wynne hadn't been so impetuous. I'm afraid I don't understand. It's just this, Miss Foyle. Uncle Kenneth, please. You see, Kitty, I promised I wouldn't marry you for a year. Mother was going to take you under her wing and, well, prepare you. But prepare me for what? Oh, you know, some school, some good finishing school, and then... School? Are you kidding me? It needn't be a school. Some other way, perhaps. Then when you've met all our friends, learned how we do things, we can have a proper wedding. And what do you call what we've just done, a rehearsal? Now, Kitty, wait a minute. I... How about our plans, Wynn? Darling, if you'll just be patient, I... Doesn't thee wish to go to school, Miss Foyle? No, school is out, definitely. I'm the big girl now. And besides, we won't be having much to do with your friends. We won't be living in Philadelphia. Is that right, Wynn? Of course it is, dear, but it seems to me... Miss could... Foyle, thou must realize such a thing is impossible. Why? Because the Strafford money is a trust fund established by the family will. When Wynn takes unto himself a wife, he must reside in Darby Mill and assume his duties as an officer in the bank. And if he refuses? Then his inheritance would pass into the family trust. Well, all right. So Wynn isn't rich anymore. What's that to me? I didn't marry him for his money. Miss Foyle, thou art not quite reasonable. Says thou. Miss Foyle, thy temper. Mr. Kenneth, thy foot. And let's get this one thing straight. I married a man, not an institution or a trust fund or a bank. Not that I don't know what you're trying to do. You're trying to take the curse off Kitty Foyle. Buy her a phony education, polish off the rough edges, make a mainline doll out of her. Well, you ought to know better than that. It takes six generations to make people like you. And by Judas Priest, I haven't got the time. That's all. Kitty, Kitty, wait. Oh, darling, wait. Will you let me talk to you for just a minute? You had your chance to talk in there. Oh, it's no use, Wynn. They've got you under contract. Kitty, believe me, I'm going to keep my promise. We're going to New York, you and me, just as we planned. That means you'll lose your inheritance. Sure, but you don't care about the money, do you? Not me. I've never had any. 
But, Wayne, you don't know anything about not having it. I can learn. Can you learn to live in a one-room apartment with a pull-down bed and eat in drugstores and go to movies once a week and try to save a dollar or two at a time? Can you learn that, Wynne? If we're together. But can you be happy living that way? If we're together. Wait for me, Kitty. Wait here. I'm going in to tell them. It's no use, Wynne. It wouldn't work. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye. So you walked out of there and went back to New York. And you went through all the motions of living, but you really weren't living at all. And after a while, you got your divorce. And a few months later, you read in the papers, Winwood Strafford VI takes society bride. That was a tough time, wasn't it, Kitty? You'd never have gotten through it without Mark, big, rough, and kind, and always around when you needed him. Five years. And every year, he'd ask the same thing. Kitty, will you marry me? And every year, you said no. Until tonight. Hey, hey, you did say yes, didn't you? I mean, you know what I asked you. You asked me to marry you. Oh, honey. Honey, you're not kidding yourself. It wouldn't be any good if you weren't sure. Oh, Mark, darling. I'm sure. Then it's a date? It's a date. Oh, swell, swell. Pick me up at St. Timothy's Hospital at 12. And, Kitty, it would have been so easy if only when hadn't shown up. I tried their life, Kitty. It didn't work. I know what I want now. This time it's for keeps. Oh, when it's too late. It's five years too late. It's not too late, Kitty. It'll never be too late for us. Try to tell me it is. Just try. Oh, when, darling, don't make me say it. Don't make me say anything. Don't let me think. Oh, Kitty, uh, I've got to tell you. I haven't much to offer except me. I tried to get a divorce. She wouldn't give me one. I wish it were different. Oh, it doesn't matter. We'll be together. Oh, Kitty, Kitty. The boat sails at midnight. You won't be late. Uh, if anything, I'll be there an hour early. Kitty, it's getting late, Kitty. They'll both be waiting. Kitty, you've got to make up your mind. Yes, I, I've got to make up my mind. Hello, desk. This is Miss Foyle. Will you have the boy come up for my bags? Yes, and, and please ask the doorman to get me a cab. <laughs> Sorry to be losing you, Miss Foyle. We don't get many pretty girls around here. Thank you. Oh, and Joe. Yes, ma'am? I think... I think a young man will be calling for me. Probably a little after midnight. Tell him... Oh, just a minute. Uh, I'd better write this down. It was very excited, I imagine. And very insistent. Yeah. Very excited. Tell him I'll never forget him. Never forget him. Tell him... I'll always love him in a very special way. Always love him in a special way. And tell him I'm being married tonight. You're being married to... Hey, what is this? Driver, St. Timothy's Hospital, please. On behalf of the Motion Picture Relief Fund, thank you, William Lundigan, Henry Fonda, and Olivia de Havilland for your fine performances in tonight's play. And now, before we tell you about next week's program, here's a word from one of America's best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. Have you ever heard people whispering about a friend of yours, guessing her age, hinting that she's older than she is? That hurts, doesn't it? Your heart goes out to her. But what if you should be put in that same position? You might be if you don't guard your skin against those tiny lines, that dry look which makes even young skin look years older. Don't let your skin give this false impression. Use the cream that's especially designed to lubricate and soften your skin while it cleanses. My unique Lady Esther for purpose face cream. 
faithful use of my wonderful Lady Esther cream will work wonders to keep your skin looking as young or even younger than you are. It will guard your skin against dryness, keep it softer, more supple, actually help prevent those tiny lines. Remember, my Lady Esther cream is not just a cleansing cream. It's far more. It does four of the things your skin needs most. Cleanses thoroughly, lubricates and softens your skin, helps nature refine your pores, and makes a perfect powder base. Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream needs no help from any other cream. Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will present A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. It will star Ann Baxter, Peggy Ann Garner, and Frank McHugh. Kitty Foyle was produced and directed for Lady Esther by Bill Lawrence, adapted by Harry Cronman, and was presented through the courtesy of RKO, producers of the Technicolor production Sinbad the Sailor, starring Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and Maureen O'Hara. Olivia de Havilland can currently be seen in the Paramount production to each his own. Henry Fonda will soon be seen in John Ford's RKO release, The Fugitive. William Lundigan can soon be seen in the Hunt Stromberg production, Dishonored Lady. You save enough on the largest size jar of Lady Esther face cream to buy a box of Lady Esther face powder. So remember, ask for the largest size. Music on tonight's program was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. This is Truman Bradley speaking for Lady Esther. Thank you, and good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.